In the glittering heart of New York City, where ambition touches the sky, the legendary Vanderbilt Triple Palace Mansion once reigned supreme, shining brightly on Fifth Avenue in the heart of the Gilded Age, in the Triple Palace's resplendent halls and opulent rooms, the creme de la creme of high society danced, dined and whispered secrets, turning this grandiose residence into the pulsating heart of New York's elite. And this one-of-a-kind mansion wasn't merely a home, it was the very embodiment of extravagance and an architectural marvel that actually helped shape Fifth Avenue into the most famous street for luxury in the world. Yet, in a dramatic twist that echoes the capricious nature of the Vanderbilt fortune itself, this emblem of splendor and wealth spiraled into an unimaginable decline. In a heart-wrenching finale, this once majestic symbol of the unfathomable wealth in the Big Apple was demolished, its downfall a poignant reminder of the ephemeral nature of riches and the relentless march of time. In today's episode, we'll retell the entire saga of the legendary Vanderbilt Triple Palace, from its heyday to its shocking downfall, as we describe why New York's most luxurious Gilded Age mansion was demolished. In order to best understand both the unimaginable wealth and unspeakable demolition of the Triple Palace, we must first get acquainted with its owners. You see, in the history of America's Gilded Age during the late 19th century, the story of William Henry Vanderbilt soon took center stage as his surname became a byword for ambition and architectural grandeur. The son of Cornelius Vanderbilt, William Henry was born into a world where his father's remarkable journey from a modest farmer to a titan of industry cast a long shadow. Cornelius, who started with a simple ferry service in New York Harbor, expanded his empire into the realms of maritime trade and later the burgeoning railroad industry, all the while amassing unparalleled wealth and influence. Thus, William Henry grew up witnessing his father's relentless pursuit of success, a trait that profoundly shaped his own aspirations and approach to life. His upbringing, under the guidance of a father who was not just an entrepreneur, but a tough-as-nails visionary, instilled in him a deep understanding of business and the importance of strategic thinking. Throughout his youth, William Henry often found himself at the receiving end of his father's harsh criticisms, with Cornelius frequently dismissing his eldest son as a blockhead and a blatherskin. Such harsh words left a deep impact on William Henry, who harbored a strong desire to prove to his father that he was far from being a blatherskite. Yet he never mustered the courage to confront the Commodore directly. This complex relationship with his father played a pivotal role in shaping William Henry for the enormous responsibilities he would later assume as the successor to the Vanderbilt legacy and as the new patriarch in the family behind some of America's most grandiose early mega-mansions. Then the death of Cornelius in 1877 marked a turning point for William Henry, who inherited not just a colossal fortune, but also the onus of perpetuating the Vanderbilt dynasty. Consequently, in 1878, William Henry seized the moment to establish his own legacy and honor his father's grand visions by commencing the construction of what would be known as the Triple Palace. This endeavor was more than just the creation of a sumptuous residence. It was a tangible manifestation of the Vanderbilt family's ascending social prominence and William Henry's personal ambitions. Indeed, the project was likely a deliberate and strategic move to assert his worthiness as the steward of the Vanderbilt name and to demonstrate that he had indeed emerged from the shadow of his father's overwhelming presence. Therefore, it is reasonable to assert that the construction of the Triple Palace was not just an architectural feat, but a psychological triumph for William Henry. In building such an extravagant mansion, he not only solidified his position as a formidable figure in business and society, but also symbolically contested his father's earlier doubts about his capabilities. We could perhaps say that it was William Henry's way of silently proclaiming to the world, and perhaps to the spirit of his late father, that he was indeed worthy of carrying the name Vanderbilt, and that this grand edifice stood as an emblem of his success. However, little did William Henry know that soon after the construction of his grand mansion was complete, he himself would meet an unexpected end, and have little time to enjoy this architectural icon built to give proof to his late father of his son's worthiness. In 1879, William Henry Vanderbilt first began to enliven his vision for what would become the Triple Palace by acquiring a prime land lot on the west side of Fifth Avenue, nestled between 51st and 52nd Streets. 
This site, once the domain of sheep farmer Isaiah Kaiser, and positioned diagonally across from the majestic St. Patrick's Cathedral, came with a significant history and a hefty price tag of $500,000. A figure adjusted downward from its original $800,000 asking price in the aftermath of the Panic of 1873. However, this strategic acquisition was more than just an investment, it was a statement. The site's location and its exorbitant cost were reflective of the Vanderbilt family's rising prominence and their commitment to establishing a formidable presence on Fifth Avenue. And this vision for grandeur was shared by Vanderbilt's elder sons, Cornelius and William Kissam, who were concurrently planning their own stately residences nearby. Cornelius Vanderbilt the second house, five blocks to the north, and William K. Vanderbilt House, just a block away. By April 1879, the stage was set, as existing tenants on the newly acquired property were vacated, paving the way for Vanderbilt's grand vision. The year 1881 marked the commencement of this monumental project. To bring his vision to life, he employed John B. Snook and Charles B. Atwood for the mansion's design and furnishing. Additionally, the renowned Herter brothers were brought on board to enhance the interior with their decorative expertise. Now, while Snook was officially the architect on record for the mansion, there is compelling evidence indicating the involvement of both Atwood and the Herter brothers in the project. This collaboration, however, was not without its complexities. The Herter brothers challenged the narrative that solely credited Snook or Atwood with the mansion's overall design, and this dispute reached a public forum when the Herter brothers voiced their concerns in a letter to American Architect and Building News. Responding to this contention, the journal's editors noted that the building permit for the mansion listed both Atwood and Snook's names, seemingly affirming their primary roles in the design process. This detail underscores the intricate dynamics and collaborative efforts behind the creation of Vanderbilt's mansion. The involvement of these distinguished architects and decorators, each with their unique contributions, illustrates the elaborate and multifaceted nature of this architectural endeavor. Now, the mansion's interiors, a fusion of luxury and cutting-edge design, featured a majestic staircase and state-of-the-art amenities, setting a new benchmark for residential grandeur. The design of the 58 rooms in Vanderbilt's section was a kaleidoscope of styles, each room a unique homage to the Vanderbilt family's diverse tastes and meticulous attention to detail. Drawing inspiration from European palaces, the mansion's architectural blueprint, conceived in 1882, was a grandiose celebration of opulence on an unprecedented scale. The residence comprised two distinct sections, a southern single-family unit for William Henry Vanderbilt and a northern two-family unit for his daughters and their families. This innovative design concept allowed for familial proximity while respecting the individuality and privacy of its inhabitants. The palace's every detail, from spatial arrangements to decorative elements, was a deliberate expression of the Vanderbilt's aesthetic preferences. The ground floor housed an ornate dining room, library, parlor, and drawing room. The second floor was reserved for the private quarters of William, his wife, and their youngest children. A standout architectural marvel was the colossal ballroom, ingeniously designed to merge the drawing rooms of each section into a singular, expansive space spanning an entire city block. And the construction of the Triple Palace was a significant undertaking, mobilizing hundreds of workers and altering the very fabric of Midtown Manhattan. In 1883, the mansion pioneered the use of steel framing, a revolutionary technique that would later become synonymous with skyscraper construction. Additionally, imported marbles were integrated into the design, enhancing the mansion's luxurious appeal these innovations were not merely aesthetic, they marked a significant advancement in architectural technology, laying the groundwork for the construction of more formidable structures. However, the project was not devoid of challenges. Integrating modern utilities into such an ambitious design was a formidable task, reflective of the broader complexities faced by architects during this era of rapid urbanization and technological progress. But then, the mansion's completion in 1882 was a remarkable achievement, showcasing the expertise and determination of the architects and workers. It comprised a southern single-family unit for Vanderbilt and a northern two-family unit for his daughters. Tragically, less than five years after its completion, William Henry Vanderbilt passed away in December 1885. His will ensured that the mansion and its contents would remain within the family. 
with his wife Maria receiving a life interest and his youngest son George a future interest in the property. However, despite the legendary patriarch's untimely demise coinciding with early days of the history of the mansion, the fun at the Triple Palace was actually just beginning. Now the Triple Palace, in the 1890s, became synonymous with extravagant events, drawing the elite of New York society. These events were not mere social gatherings, but grand spectacles that held the city's attention. The Vanderbilt Ball, a highlight of this era, was more than a mere party. It was a magnificent display of wealth and power, changing the dynamics of New York's elite society. It began with a unique hobby horse quadrille and lasted until the early morning hours, leaving an indelible mark on the attendees and the city's social scene. And the guest list at these events read like a who's who of the Gilded Age. Members of the 400, led by Caroline Shermerhorn Astor, graced these events, setting the standards for high society. And their presence not only elevated the status of these gatherings, but also reflected the societal hierarchy of the time. Now, entertainment at the Triple Palace was diverse and opulent. Theatre troupes, ventriloquists, hypnotists, poets, comedians, choirs and orchestras were regular features, providing a rich tapestry of experiences and art exhibitions and lessons in singing, dancing and cooking added to the cultural richness of the mansion, offering a variety of experiences to its distinguished guests. The media of the era played a pivotal role in amplifying the impact of these events. Newspapers with their banner headlines and detailed coverage brought these gatherings into the public domain, creating a buzz around the Triple Palace and its events. This coverage not only intensified the public's fascination, but also cemented the mansion's place in New York's social history. However, despite its grandeur and influence, the Triple Palace faced criticism, particularly for its overt display of wealth. But the mansion's architectural presence on Fifth Avenue significantly influenced the street's transformation into a prestigious address. Its opulence inspired the construction of other lavish mansions, not only in New York, but also elsewhere, reflecting the era's emphasis on wealth and status. Thus, by the turn of the century, the Triple Palace had gained recognition for its architectural and social significance. Its influence extended beyond architecture and high society, playing a crucial role in transforming Fifth Avenue into a luxury retail destination. This Vanderbilt Triple Palace, in all its splendor, was therefore not just a home or a venue for gatherings, it was a cultural institution, a symbol of an era, and a reflection of the Vanderbilt family's stature in American history. However, almost as quickly as its heyday commenced, it would soon fall apart, as the valleys and peaks of the new tumultuous 20th century would begin. In the early 20th century, the architectural landscape of New York was undergoing a remarkable transformation. At the heart of this evolution was the southern half of the Vanderbilt Mansion, a splendid structure that caught the attention of Henry Clay Frick. A titan in the railroad industry, Frick was no stranger to luxury and prestige, and his interest in the mansion mirrored his ascent in the business world. It all started in January 1905, when Douglas Robinson of Robinson, Brown & Company informed Frick of the rental opportunity for this illustrious space. Seizing the moment, Frick and his wife embarked on an ambitious renovation project, spearheaded by Hunt & Hunt, costing a substantial $100,000 at the time. Their efforts brought modern touches to the mansion, introducing electric lighting and contemporary bathrooms, a clear reflection of their forward-thinking vision. And the renovation was more than an exercise in modernization. It was a statement of Frick's status. A new brownstone wall and a private driveway off Fifth Avenue were not merely functional, but symbols of exclusivity and privacy. By October 1905, the Fricks had moved into this reimagined space, making it a home reflective of their stature. Despite attempts to purchase the mansion, legal constraints tied to Vanderbilt's will prevented this, leading Frick to eventually commission his own residence on the Upper East Side. But as the century further unfolded, societal shifts began to reshape the fabric of New York's elite. The preference for more intimate and discreet living spaces marked a departure from the grandeur of the Vanderbilt Triple Palace. The mansion, once a beacon of luxury, found itself at odds with the evolving ethos of high society. After Frick's departure, Cornelius Vanderbilt III undertook a half-million-dollar renovation under the guidance of Horace Trumbauer. 
This period marked a resurgence in the mansion's significance, hosting dignitaries and world leaders, including Winston Churchill. Yet, as the 1920s dawned, the relentless march of commercialization along Fifth Avenue, coupled with escalating taxes, signaled a change. The once residential area was yielding to commercial interests, a shift that saw Emily Vanderbilt Sloan part with the northern residents, and then the Great Depression further complicated the Vanderbilt legacy. Financial pressures led to unprecedented decisions, such as opening the Biltmore estate to the public. Therefore, the Vanderbilt Triple Palace, a marvel of its time, similarly had to confront the realities of the era. The burdensome costs of upkeep in an economy gripped by depression made the maintenance of such a lavish property a challenge too great to surmount. And soon, the ultimate decision would have to be made if it was worth it to even keep the mansion in existence at all. The year 1940 marked a significant turning point in the mansion's storied history. Cornelius III parted with the southern portion of the Triple Palace, selling it to the William Waldorf Astor estate. This transaction, executed contrary to the desires of the original builder and owner, the aforementioned William Henry Vanderbilt, signaled the commencement of a transformational era for the property. The Astor estate, keen on redevelopment, then sought to repurpose the site, which had become enveloped by burgeoning commercial enterprises, including the notable Rockefeller Center. It was during this transitory phase that the Vanderbilts orchestrated their last grand events within the mansion's walls. A brief glimpse into its majestic interiors was offered to the public in July 1941, with an admission fee aimed at supporting the United Service organizations. Moreover, an American Red Cross benefit in February 1942 saw over a thousand guests grace its halls. However, the demise of Cornelius III in March 1942 marked an end to its era of grandeur, as noted by the Herald Tribune. Then the Astor's vision for the site materialized in 1944 with plans for a commercial establishment. The following year witnessed Grace, Cornelius III's widow, auctioning off the Vanderbilt art collection, a sale that resulted in a financial loss compared to the collection's original value. However, tragically, the demolition of its southern section began in 1947, culminating in the complete raising of the structure by March 1949, paving the way for new buildings at 640 and 655th Avenue. And the mansion's downfall was met with media lamentation, acknowledging its role as a relic of a bygone era. Its replacement by modern commercial buildings signified a pivotal alteration in the city's architectural and socio-economic fabric. Yet, these days in the 21st century, fascination with the Gilded Age's architectural splendors, especially the Triple Palace, persists among historians and the general public. This interest is not merely nostalgic, but also serves as a source of inspiration for contemporary architectural pursuits. And the mansion's influence is notably seen in Henry Clay Frick's decision to construct a residence mirroring its style, now renowned as the Frick Collection. Therefore, the Triple Palace, in its journey from magnificence to memory, encapsulates more than just an architectural story. It represents a crucial chapter in New York's evolving identity, a reflection of the city's perpetual metamorphosis, and now, we'd like to hear from you in the comments. Do you believe that the city of New York should always save buildings like this of historical significance? Or is its demolition just a reflection of the changes of time and how shifts in ownership work naturally? We love hearing your thoughts, and we appreciate your viewership here with us at Old Money Mansions. Cheers. Until next time.